Meet the Reverend William Paley, an old enemy of evolution. He put forward the most lucid argument for the existence of a divine creator, and his argument has been used ever since to try and shoot down Darwin. Paley likened all living things to a clock or watch. Random forces, he said, cannot explain how all these beautiful springs and gears came together to tell time. Nor can they explain the organs of living things. No purposeless process could ever fashion such intricate detail. No blind leap of chance could ever construct such complex machinery. Just as watches require the existence of a watchmaker, so nature requires the hand of an omnipotent designer. And to Paley that meant God, which has made Paley the patron saint of today's so-called scientific creationists. Evolutionary biologists think Paley's argument is as mistaken as it is elegant and thought they'd disposed of it ages ago. For the showpiece of 18th century theology was the argument to design, the view that the order of nature declared the Creator's glory. The harmonious motions of the stars and planets and the indefinitely complex and adapted complexities of animal life alike testify to the infinite power and wisdom of the divine architect. Just as the appearance of a ship or of a timepiece gives us infallible reason to believe in design and workmanship, so the parallel organization of nature gives us infallible reason to believe in divine authorship. This argument is, of course, still rampant. It is the centerpiece of almost all contemporary evangelizing, and is the special exhibit of creationists and their sympathizers. Philo directs a withering battery of doubts at the argument to design. He points out that it is an argument by analogy, but that any analogy between a human construction and the whole frame of nature is stretched and tenuous. He points out that we cannot infer the unity of a designer from the fact of design, Ships and watches are the products of countless designers, offering generations of designs, gradually refining their predecessors in a process of trial and error. He asks about the lurking infinite regress of designers responsible for designers. He points out that the world resembles an animal or vegetable just as closely as it resembles any human construction, and that in that case, design as we are familiar with it, which means human contrivance, is just one rather limited, minuscule way in which things in one corner of the cosmos happen. So why make it a supreme model for the whole? He reminds us that in the world as we find it, minds depend upon bodies, not the other way around. He points out that the problem of reconciling the harsh ways of nature with an infinitely good, knowing and capable deity is actually made much worse by reliance on the argument to design. In its usual form, the problem of evil is only a matter of trying to show that natural evils are somehow compatible with the goodness of God. That is hard enough, but it is much harder, and in fact impossible, to claim that they afford any kind of argument for that goodness, so that we can infer God's boundless goodness from his apparently faulty creation. Yet this is what anyone relying on the design argument must do, and Hume has a lot of fun with it. But Darwinism always needs defending. Creationism keeps on resurfacing to attack it. And never in such bizarre fashion as in the Bible Belt of the USA.